Uh, hi, my name is Owen Maiden. Uh, I am a graduate student in the Schertz Research Group and an Open Course Field Fellow. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the future plans we have for looking at non-bonded interactions, uh, particularly using Bayesian approaches. Um, so currently we've made a lot of good progress in our force field fitting as an effort as a whole. Um, so if you look at uh, the partially force field, it's done a lot of improvements, but this is mainly through uh, targeted fitting of bonded interaction parameters. So uh, bonds, angles, and torsions. <laughs> One thing that we haven't really looked at a lot so far is the non-bonded interactions. So electrostatics and Van der Waals interactions. Um, <clears throat> So I'm going to focus today a little bit on the uh, Van der Waals, commonly used uh, the Leonard Jones model, uh, but we hope to <clears throat> use this kind of analysis for electrostatics of the future. So the problem that we have with uh, Leonard Jones, <clears throat> Leonard Jones fitting is that one, there's limited data, so we're training instead of training against quantum uh, quantum calculations, we have to train against macroscopic observables. So we're really kind of limited to what people, what experiments people have actually done. And also the, there's kind of a black box nature to the problem. Uh, so for example, you know, if you have a Van der Waals model that is parameterized with some set of parameters, so say for example, Leonard Jones is the most common, um, then you can get microscopic behavior um, from there. But then there's also other factors that go into that like electrostatics and bonded interactions. And then from there, you can run equilibrium simulations and then you get your macroscopic properties, which is the target that you're fitting against. So there's a lot of intermediate steps here. And these intermediate steps uh, are not really all that visible to us. We don't have a really easy understanding of if I change uh, X parameter, then I'll get X change in macroscopic property. Um, so in addition to this, there's also a lot of decisions that we need to make about parameters and functional forms. So there are discrete choices of functionals or models and continuous choice, choices of parameters within those models. Uh, so for example, a discrete choice is something like the number of atom types you have in a model. Uh, Mike Gilson talked at length about, uh, length about this yesterday. Um, another thing is Leonard Jones combining rules. So when you have those atom types, how do you actually uh, parameterize those interactions between unlike types? And then you also have continuous choices of parameters. So for example, in your Leonard Jones, um, in your Leonard Jones functional, you have an epsilon and a sigma, um, something like that. And so <clears throat> there's a lot of factors going on here. And what we're interested in doing is making decisions based on statistical evidence for individual models and sets of parameters. Uh, so how do we plan on doing that? Uh, and the technique that we're interested in using is called Bayesian inference. So Bayesian inference, uh, provides us a natural framework for making decisions about models. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with Bayesian inference, we like to look at posterior distributions. Posterior distributions uh, are a combination of a likelihood distribution and a prior distribution. Uh, and so what do these really mean? Well, a prior distribution is kind of your reasonable knowledge about the model that you have before you perform your specific uh, experiments. So you might not have all that much prior knowledge um, if this isn't a model you have, you've studied before, so you might put a pretty flat prior on what you're looking at, or if this is something that you've studied before, you might have a reasonable idea of what's going on already, and you'll have a more peaked prior. Uh, and then from there, there's a likelihood distribution, which is uh, talking about how well does your set of your model and set of parameters reproduce a specific data set. So, you know, you have some new data set in terms of physical properties, uh, and then you evaluate your model based on its performance relative to that. Uh, and then you'll get an idea of what your likelihood looks like. When you put these together, then these become the posterior distribution that combines kind of that specific likelihood with the more general prior knowledge that you already had. Uh, and so, how are we going to use this to uh, decide between models? Well, if we look at the posterior distributions uh, and integrate under the curve, then we'll get a normalizing constant. And the normalizing constant of a posterior distribution can be thought of as model evidence. Uh, so if you take ratios of those normalizing constants, ratios of that model evidence, you can interpret that as odds in favor of a model. So for example, if you have 
um, one model that has three times the normalizing constant than another model, you can interpret that as three to one odds in favor of that model. Uh, and so this is obviously a bit of a simplistic picture in a one dimensional case, um, but you can imagine, you know, if you have models that are more uncertain, that have lower values for their priors, then you're going to get, uh, those models are gonna be penalized. Uh, and so how do we apply this specifically to the problems that we're looking at? Um, this is gonna make it allow us to make data-driven choices between models. So again, if we give, you know, if <clears throat> For, any, for an example, you know, if we go from a model with three atom types to a model with four atom types, uh, you know, similar to what Mike Gilson was looking at earlier, uh, and we see that there is uh, the base factor favors the model with three atom types, then we can say, eh, well, it's not really worth it for us to add that extra atom type. Uh, it's probably better off just to stick with what we had. We're not getting, uh, we're not getting a lot of extra mileage out of that extra type. Uh, and so, when we're computing these, uh, we need a way of computing these posterior distributions. And because these are like these black, uh, black box problems, uh, we can't do this analytically. We have to use some sort of Monte Carlo sampling in order to get these values out. So that process looks something like this. Uh, we'll start somewhere, propose a new set of parameter values, um, and then you can evaluate the posterior distribution for the set and the previous set. Um, then from there, you'll either, you'll accept or reject the move that you make. So in this case, you accept your move and you treat that new uh, set of parameters as a draw from the, uh, from the posterior distribution. Uh, and then from there, if we do this enough times, we're able to uh, construct uh, <coughs> posterior probability distributions. Uh, and I wanna note that I have done this, I've shown this example for parameters, but it's also possible for us to do this over model, state, model space using a technique called reversible jump Monte Carlo. We can make moves between not only continuous parameter spaces, but also discrete model spaces. Um, that's the technique that we've been using to look at the differences between normalizing constants. Uh, and so the way that we interpret that is, you know, if you're sampling if you're sampling both models well and you sample one 10 times more than the other model, then that model is probably 10 times better. This isn't the only way to compute the base factors, but it's what we've been using currently. Um, you can imagine, uh, you're probably thinking about this and saying, well, if you have to run an equilibrium simulation to evaluate your model every time you do a Monte Carlo step, this isn't really gonna be feasible. Uh, and I agree. Uh, and so that's why our plan is to use surrogate models to accelerate the sampling of, of the posteriors. Uh, and you, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you kind of have these intermediate steps where you, know, you get the microscopic behavior and then do a simulation and then you get your um, macroscopic properties. Uh, with a surrogate model, uh, you know, there's obviously going to be a little <coughs> um, uncertainty added here, but then you can go directly from your model and parameters to the macroscopic properties. So essentially, uh, <clears throat> this would be an analytical function that you can put in your parameters and you can get out uh, the response of your observable. Um, so in order to test this strategy, we looked at a simple case study. Uh, so this is a two-center Leonard Jones plus quadrupole model. Um, you can use this to parameterize diatomic and diatomic-like molecules. Uh, so the model has two Leonard Jones sites that have an epsilon and a sigma parameter. It also has a variable bond length that separates those two Leonard Jones sites uh, and a parameter, a quadrupole parameter that controls the strength of the quadrupole interaction. And because we have these different uh, parameters, we can split this into different levels of complexity. So for example, you can say, well, I want a quadrupole parameter or I want uh, no quadrupole interaction, have it set to zero. Um, or you can say, I'm gonna fix my bond length, or not fix my bond length. Uh, and the nice thing about this, uh, about this model is that there are pre-existing surrogate models uh, for density, saturation, pressure, and surface tension already developed in the literature. So we don't have to do the legwork in this case of building a surrogate model ourselves. So previously, someone took advantage of these surrogate models and performed uh, multi-criteria optimization over the parameter space. Uh, and they produce some parameter sets for a two criteria case. So that's just liquid density and saturation pressure and a three criteria case that also included surface tension. And what we noticed from their data was that when you go from the two criteria case to the three criteria case, 
the quadrupole is being driven to zero. Uh, and so this begs the question, is it worth it for us to include the quadrupole parameter in this model? And we can answer this using Bayesian inference. <coughs> um, so we ran our Bayesian inference process uh, doing reversible jump Monte Carlo over the model space and the parameter space. Uh, and so we got some model and parameter distributions out of that. So the model distribution looks a little bit like this. It's a discrete distribution um, between the AUA model, which is a model without a quadrupole, and the AUA plus Q model, which is a model with a quadrupole. And what you can see here is that there are about four to one odds um, in favor of the model without a quadrupole. And so what is, this is telling us is that for this specific molecule, a quadrupole is most likely not justified. Um, and so this, this level of uh, substantial evidence that I've written here is kind of a uh, common heuristic for, uh, for Bayes factors. Uh, substantial evidence is something like a Bayes factor three to 20, and then strong evidence above that is 20 or higher. So this is kind of, it's a little bit arbitrary, but it's kind of a commonly used heuristic in the field. Uh, and another thing that we get out of this is we get our parameter distributions. Um, so this is really nice information as well because we get to see the shapes of our parameter distributions. We learn a lot about the correlation between these, uh, between these parameters, and we can even get maximum a posteriori estimates of what these parameter sets should be. Uh, and if there's you know, some sort of multimodality, like there is a little bit in this case, we can also notice that too. So we get a lot of information about our parameter distributions. Um, so looking at this, for a whole bunch of different uh, cases and molecules, we find that in general, the quadrupole interaction is not justified. Uh, for almost all of these, uh, the model without a quadrupole is preferred. For the one case that the quadrupole, um, that the model with the quadrupole is preferred, that's for uh, acetylene in a two criteria case. In a three criteria case, it goes back to, <coughs> um, goes back to, looking for a, uh, a model without a quadrupole. Um, so this is kind of the, the question that we've answered here is for, um, for this case, for these molecules and these, and these uh, properties that we're looking at, it's probably not worth it for us to include a quadrupole. Um, so this is a relatively simple example. And the next step is how do we extend this past these simple model systems? So obviously in open force field, we're building biomolecular force fields. So these models are gonna be a lot more complex than the simple model I was looking at earlier. Um, <clears throat> and so we need to build surrogate models. Uh, and <clears throat> what we really need to do when we're doing that is reduce the computational cost as much as, probable, uh, much as possible. So we're looking at a multi-fidelity approach where we start with direct simulation, which is kind of our gold standard for observables, right? That's generally how we get observables. And then from there, we can use thermodynamic reweighting to get some information about uh, the response in the local region of that direct simulation. And then from there, when we combine multiple direct simulation points and some thermodynamic reweighting, then on top of that, we can build an analytical model that should be quick to evaluate and do a reasonable job of approaching, of uh, approximating the response surface. Um, and so, we need simple analytical models that work well when we can only sample the true surface minimally. Um, so obviously, because these evaluations, these equilibrium simulations are expensive, we <clears throat> need to do that as little as possible. And so the models that we're interested in looking at um, for this process are Gaussian processes. Uh, they do well when you have minimal obser observations and they scale reasonably well with dimensionality. Um, so our next challenge uh, in learning how to build these models is how do we place our observations? What can we do to make sure that the observations that we're using uh, are giving us the most bang for our buck? Uh, and so we need to be looking for kind of a general strategy. Uh, and, you know, there's a possibility of using some gradient based methods to get us in the right regions and then start to do this. Um, but in general, uh, we're interested in also adapting surrogate models on the fly. So you can imagine the schema would look something like this. Uh, you start in some region, maybe far from equilibrium, or maybe you used, uh, you know, force balance to get close to, close to what you think is an equilibrium value. You start sampling, 
Uh, and eventually you move out of your model trust region, which is based on the uncertainty of your model. Well, in that case, you're gonna trigger a new simulation, which is gonna expand that trust region. Uh, and then from there, you'll continue, to trans uh, you'll continue to trigger more simulations. And eventually you'll have a pretty good picture of what your high probability regions look like. Um, so that's kind of the general strategy that we're interested in pursuing. Um, this is something that's kind of early, you know, early in the pipeline. So there's still a lot of work to be done here. Um, but these are some of the ideas, these are some of the areas that we're going to apply this to. Um, so we're really interested in, <clears throat> in using this a lot for our Leonard Jones fitting, but also for electrostatics in the future. Uh, we can examine and improve models for combination rules. So the commonly used Lorentz Berthelot com combination rules are probably a little bit simplistic. Uh, we might be able to get some extra mileage out of our Leonard Jones there. Uh, number of smirks types. So this is kind of, again, what Mike Gilson was looking at. Uh, when is it worth it to actually split off an atom type into more than one atom types? Uh, this will allow us to quantitatively decide uh, when we're doing that. Uh, another uh, bigger change would be functional forms of Van der Waals interactions. So uh, obviously Leonard Jones 12.6 is the most commonly used, but we could also look at uh, me potential or Buckingham potential um, to kind of look at that repulsive uh, exponent. Uh, and then moving into electrostatics, uh, further down the line, we want to look at bond charge correction schemes and uh, make decisions between those. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll thank you for all thank you all for your attention and open it up to questions.